So I thought if you can share, you know, your experience or your work, and also how can we deal with all these facets, dimensions, to bring inclusivity for different people. Uh, for having personally faced uh, many, many such challenges, uh, myself and uh, our friend S.P. Nagesh, uh, we felt we got to be uh, people who will focus on finding solutions to these challenges. For having played cricket first national tournament, and then Jars organized being a cricket in the nation. Uh, in 1997, uh, we started an organization called Samarthanam Trust for the Disabled. Because individually I thought it would be very, very difficult to find solutions or even if I have solutions, to make them available was next to impossible. So we started this organization. Through this, uh, we have started addressing all these key challenges. So what we did is we started supporting higher education to start with visually impaired children going to college. So we convert print books into digital audio books. We organize readers to read those books to them. We identify <coughs> people who can write their exams. We go and talk to the management of the colleges to view admissions. Like this, so we play a catalyst role and play a facilitating role so that the needs of visually impaired and other disabled are addressed. Uh, systematically and Samantha is a platform where we run several infrastructure related uh, programs like we run a hostel uh, though we want our uh, kids to stay in the mainstream community hostels and PGs and all uh, that is our intention but often they struggle to adjust there so we had to start so what we did instead of uh, yes, we tried our best to make them inclusive there, mm -hmm. but they found it difficult. <coughs> we started accommodating non-disabled also along with disabled children. So probably you can call it as a reverse integration or whatever. But basically we created an atmosphere where it became inclusive. So in the middle of education, we uh, support from primary education to post-graduation. We produced first blind child content. Uh, uh, she worked with Infosys and uh, she went to uh, the organizations. And a uh, few of our students managed to crack CAT and uh, got admissions to most premier institutions like IM Bangalore, Calcutta, Lucknow. And our students were the first blind to go to FMS Delhi. So, like this, uh, because of screen reading software support system, reading service support system, and uh, technology. Technology is huge and ever now. So we use extensively, uh, especially for higher education. Likewise, hostels for uh, old girls and boys. And uh, similarly, after education, skilling is a major area where we address because uh, not every <coughs> disabled can go to premier institutions or uh, premier colleges. Many of them, after 10, 12, like that, they drop off. Like our Musala sir was mentioning. 80% of them drops off off to 7th standard. And uh, some statistics say not more than 10% of disabled people in India uh, go to schools and colleges. So you can imagine the difficulties. So we run a training program centers. We have in uh, uh, seven different places across the country. Six are in Karnataka, four are in North Karnataka. So North Karnataka people should take advantage of this. At least uh, in the last six years, we must have trained uh, 2,000 disabled people of this part of the world. More than 1,000 plus, 1,500, I'm not sure. Ashok, uh, they, they can tell us. So they have found jobs. They are working in companies like Decathlon and uh, many other companies. Uh, sometimes I uh, get to meet people whenever I go to meet corporate uh, CEOs and all. Uh, they come and meet me and say, Sir, we did training in Dharma, we did training in Gadak. So we have tried creating uh, this uh, training uh, centers Is because like me, when there was no facility here, I went to Bangalore first place. Now, uh, like me, everybody can go there, parents don't send, especially for women, uh, uh, parents don't allow them to uh, move that far. So we kept that in mind and started these training centers here. 
So likewise, uh, we encourage sports. So we have uh, produced world-class winning cricket team, uh, which has won T20 World Cup for the blind in 2012, beating Pakistan, ODI Championship, beating Pakistan again in Cape Town on 7 December 2014. And also, just about 10 days ago, on 24 January, again we beat Pakistan in the Asia Championship. So, thank you. So, our endeavor is to create opportunities, identify the talent in them, nurture it, and take it to the highest level possible. Like I mentioned, first blind child accountant, many IIMs, world class winning team. So, we did not stop there. We continue to work towards getting the maximum support to them. So, Indian uh, winning team got lakhs of rupees cash price. That was the first time. So, we go and talk to the employers, make sure the support system is created to them, uh, required softwares are provided to them, we sensitize their colleagues, the management, that initial handholding is needed. And uh, whenever the disabled person undergoes certain challenges in their uh, work atmosphere, we counsel them. So like this, uh, as an organization, we have about 400 plus employees uh, who work uh, day in and day out to make sure needs of disabled are addressed. Uh, and uh, as, as uh, I was talking to you about the challenges and the support system, what I had personally, I felt we should build it for others also. So Samarthana is a terrific platform where people who want help and people who need help, mean people who want help and people who want to help can meet together and work towards creating a, a wonderful ecosystem where everybody lives a life of dignity and uh, they should become taxpayers as a country. That's what I always uh, tell. And uh, so Samarthanam is present in a few states of the country along with being uh, in few districts of Karnataka. And we are a registered entity in the uh, United States of America and the UK now. So we want to make it a global plan, uh, definitely a very ambitious organization. But the whole idea is to create uh, accessible atmosphere for persons with disabilities. Thank you. Uh, I mean, congratulations. Whatever you have done. So, uh, so uh, John, I think you were discussing about the health and health care. If I just again look at the blind people, so the statistics says that there are 80 percent needless blind. They did not be blind when they are blind in India, just because they have not been screened, diagnosed, and so on. A simple cataract operation they can just you know start seeing. So according to you, so though I was mentioning about education, health, infrastructure, policy, society, and so on. So what? you expect in the sphere of healthcare so that the different able people can get access to that healthcare and perhaps that can even make them a better person to contribute in different ways. So can you highlight your thoughts, your experience on, on healthcare because Mantish was speaking more on the education side. Uh, there's a kind of a you know, when disability came on to the horizon as a topic, social development topic or a social topic, there was something called the medical model. Model. Which is that anybody who has a disability, the aim is to fix it. Okay. So, if you have an eye problem, then go to the doctor and have it fixed. Or the government has the prevention and, you know, they, they have the uh, national blindness control program and they've got the hearing, uh, sound hearing program which is... Uh, uh, there for the hearing and speech impaired. Uh, they have various programs to stop, prevent disability, treat disability. But I think the main issue is people with disability themselves. Because uh, the two of us were sitting on stage just now. Both of us have eye conditions which doctors have no answers to. So there is no fix. So what happens to people who have no fix? So. You know, as I said in the previous session, I asked the honorable doctor as to uh, what happens to people. We come to the doctor and the doctor examines us and says, well, you don't have a cataract, you don't have a corneal problem, uh, you don't have this problem, that problem, which is within the control of the medical profession. There are a huge number of 
eye conditions which cannot be treated and people have to live with it. So, and, and as a visually impaired person, people have a need for access to healthcare services and I think uh, uh, just like healthcare is being provided for the mainstream population, I think uh, access to healthcare, I think the challenges are similar. The only challenge is that as Mahantesh said, maybe people with disability are given lower priority even within the family and the community and therefore their health needs might not necessarily be of prime uh, the priority for the family or the community. So that could be a worry. But I think the general health care services, the challenges they face, I think that would apply to people with disability also. Uh, I think the issue of transportation and travel would be a major challenge for disabled people to avail of uh, healthcare services. Uh, accessibility to buildings and hospitals and healthcare centers again could be a challenge. Uh, so, and then probably uh, the sheer social and family negligence simply because the person is disabled. So, uh, but I think the thing that I'm worried about more is, uh, and I think I'd like to flag it off just now, that when we approach a medical professional, we approach the medical professional with a lot of hope. Because we believe that the doctor has the answer to everything, as a layman or as a lay person. But the truth is that he will examine you and tell you, okay, you've got this problem, you can take this medicine. You've got this problem, there is no cure. Now, walking away from a clinic or a hospital with the words, there is no cure, there is nothing that I can do for you, mm -hmm. is a very depressing thought, a very scary thought. And the, and the fact is, all of a sudden you lose your eyesight and say, my God, the world is come to an end. But believe me, ladies and gentlemen, the world does not come to an end if your eyesight is taken away. I will not talk about others, I will just talk about myself. Uh, as uh, Mr. Arvind said, Dr. Arvind said, I have a postgraduate in mathematics. I organized the first ever, first two World Cups of Cricket for the Blind. As a blind person, the logistics of organizing a blind World Cup or a sighted World Cup is the same. So, you know, so the skills required, the promotions, all that is this one. Plus, recently I had also uh, produced 13 part television serial with <coughs> Bin Shah and Harsh Shaya as the anchors. Uh, and uh, I've run three half marathons. I've run with the Olympic torch. So, you know, it is the mind that drives your life. It's not your eye that determines what you do and what you don't do. If you want to do something, you will find ways of doing it. And for, for that, you need to be empowered. There need to be the foundations laid. You need to get your education done. You need to uh, look after your health. You know, the basic infrastructure needs to be in place. And the problem today is, if the government or an organization comes up with a plan, say I want to build a mall or I want to build a park, I will not think about the disabled customers or the disabled clients. I will create something which is aesthetically good uh, and you know, flamboyant, the latest technology is used there. But people with disability miss out and only when we raise our voice will they start trying to do retrofitting which is very often not the best thing to do you know so you you know so it's important for people with disability to be seen right from the beginning as people with potential now when you say that uh, mr david blanket was the home minister of england or you say eric wehmar climbed mount everest the blind man climbed mount everest or you say Pankaj Sinha is a lawyer in the Delhi High Court being blind, you will all say wow. But I think it's not just a wow factor. I think what we need to look there is, there is potential, there is possibility. And what makes these people reach where they have reached? They got the inputs. They got the Yes, our country has problems of poverty. So when we plan our nation, the central government and state governments plan the nation, they need to recognize that disabled people are also citizens potentially can be part of the human resource and go into the investments and planning accordingly, then what you will find in the next 20 years is that you don't have to have NGOs working with the blind or NGOs working with the deaf. They will all be part of the mainstream system. John, I think you said quite a few things. Yeah. Uh, 
but you highlighted one very important thing about nation policy, infrastructure, and so on. Of course, I can tell you that those, you know, 90 percent of us or 95 percent of us who are so-called able can't run even two kilometers or three kilometers. Forget about you know running half a marathon. So really, compliments to you and also it is all about in the mind. Now, uh, I, yeah, can please. I say one thing? You know, Prime Minister Modi has announced Digital India. Now, Digital India is a tremendous opportunity to include people with disability. Tremendous opportunity. Mahatesh was talking about screen reading software, amplification software, and so on. And if you're going to digitize everything, there are three things to Digital India. One is the infrastructure is going to be digitized, uh, governance is going to be digitized, and there's going to be digi digital education, literacy. So if all these three are thought of and promoted and planned and executed, thinking about people with disability also, you will find a lot of problems in this way. You know? But I am afraid that our leaders have not really thought about this. So that is a worrying thing and that's why we need to raise our voices and a lot of advocacy needs to be Absolutely, I agree with you. I think this kind of a platform, you know, helps yeah. to share these concerns and some of them can even take these concerns to the government and right uh, uh, place. So, uh, Mr. Basaraj, you have been again with uh, the APT Association for Physically People are Physically Disabled. Let us discuss about the policy, or government policy for different labeled people. What do you, you know, you know, what kind of policy interventions we have within India, that's number one. And if at all there are policies, how these policies compare with the global policies, like you know, some of the developed world, how would it be with the different able people and how we are dealing within India and what is the situation of the policy? I remember that we keep talking about creating disabled friendly infrastructure. Perhaps this will become a law, I'm not sure. As Josh said, we can create a beautiful mall, but it is not disabled friendly. So can you please highlight about the policy? side of the discipline. Well, uh, the first, you know, the legislation, policy for the policy for disability 1995, Equal Opportunity Disability Act. So about 20, 20 years now. Uh, I must say that uh, for having, you know, that piece of legislation, things have really changed. Uh, and I would say that it's not a great change, but there's definitely a shift in mindset. And many people with disability and their parents, they fought their way to. Uh, whether I am today, whether uh, corporate today, uh, some of it, I would say this has happened because of those pieces of legislation. Certainly, what it was about 20 years ago and what it is today, a huge, huge shift in terms of the way people with disability look at it. That is what. So that's accepted. Accept. And the second fact, of course, you know, in terms of uh, taking this policy to meet this intended goal, the reality is always a huge gap. Because all of us know that any piece of policy will remain as a policy as there is an active group that pursues, that enables, that enforces. See, unfortunately, what happened was uh, many organizations or uh, many people, they had except exceptional, many of them sort of got into a mode of service delivery mode. And therefore, we were able to only do a certain work and not able to really take the advantage in the policy and change the mindset and the scope of this work. So, I think the challenge for us is how do we really some of the leaders in the civil sector start look at our role more of a facilitator, more of a role models and enabling and empowering others to take on disability work rather than be getting into too much of uh, you know, our own self delivery. So that the delivery is good, we have to have a set of model. But we also need to have a model that can scale up. We also need to have a model that can measure, that can give an impact and we have a better way of imposing on the state what it should do. I think that area of the work that needs to be done. And the second question, what was said internationally? Yeah, I think UNCRPD has been uh, accepted by our uh, uh, you know, state 
But as usual, the in the right uh, presently we are looking at you know, one piece of legislation which incorporates ENCRP disparate and all the framework still in pending. We are all hoping that if that law comes, that law will have a teeth. Unfortunately, the earlier law don't have a teeth. It only says all the public places become uh, you know, accessible. But if public places don't become accessible, there is no penalizing class. So unless there is you know, very penalizing class, none of these things in our country will be implemented. So it's like also some of the classes like based on the capacity of the government and all those kinds. So there is a lot of loose ends, although the policy was good, I think policy needs to be uh, you know, uh, 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 to be more enforcing, to be more fulfilling its goal. Uh, the ultimate one we talking about inclusion and equal opportunity. That is the philosophy, that is uh, the framework on which we need to go. So unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, we hope at least some of these things are being part of this policy and this policy will give a new future to the disability sector and to people with disability and their very good. So, just one question before I open uh, this uh, discussion uh, to the audience. Do we have at least some MLAs, MPs, Rajya Sabha, disabilities? Yeah, we do have it. The ministers we have. We have ministers. Yeah. And unfortunately, none of the ministers want to recognize with the sector most of the time. So, they never identified with the cause. And we have parents who are you know, MLAs and MPs and all that. So they always knew that they never wanted to recognize with the sector and with the sector. So therefore, there is definitely an empathy and some kind of a work, but publicly they have not come out and uh, we didn't get much out of it. You know, I just like to give you an example, uh, uh, you know, the GSP Act, it's being debated, debated, debated session after session. The PWD Act, which, was, which he was referring to in 1995, was passed in 30 seconds flat. No debate, no discussion. Which either means everybody is feeling very good for people with disability or people don't care. Yes. No. 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 So, the through more Very interesting. So, let me open because the time already I have crossed 15 minutes. Basically, we started with the slide. So, uh, let's. I wanted to address uh, an issue that, uh, and in fact, uh, raise it with Dr. Abraham. You just said that we are a lower resource setting, and that's why when we are planning, we are not thinking about the disabled. But don't you think that because we are a lower resource setting, we should be thinking more about people with challenges now, so that we don't have to pull in more resources later? Would mainstreaming not be more, would not make more sense in a low resource setting than it would in a high resource? Yeah, I agree with you. I think uh, the, uh, the, what do you call, uh, the first problem when you talk about planning, having a separate ministry for social justice and empowerment, straight away, straight away washes the hands of all other ministries. The people who control the money, the people who plan the infrastructure, the people who uh, invest in industry, the people who invest in agriculture, none of them have a stake in disability. And what people in the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment speak, the others don't really listen. So unless the Prime Minister kind of intervenes, I don't think anything really happens. Uh, you refer to resources. Uh, over the last 15, 20 years, crores of rupees lapses. Being unspent. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Also, a lot of money just goes unspent. So basically the government doesn't concern and government is bereft of ideas and the connect, our ability to connect with the government also is very limited. So, so unless the government and the stakeholders work hand in hand, resources will not be used appropriately. Solutions will be, you know, there are solutions which come up with, the government comes up with, but those solutions may not be the best. Uh, you know, people say, for blind people, immediately say, put blind, uh, braille symbols. But as, a, as he said, only 7% of the blind, the blind people go to school. Even though 7%, a lot, lot of them do not learn Braille, they get educated using e-text and so on. So, uh, Braille is no longer the real solution for accessibility and so on. So, I think there is a lot more uh, awareness, sensitivity, understanding of issues, 
a greater involvement from people who have the power to actually bring about change in the topic because everything is done, uh, you know, 15th August is the deadline. So people will wake up on the 25th of July and then work overnight and come up with something. Crores of rupees are spent, not a much use. Very unfortunate. And, and I was travelling with them in the, in the train. Um, my mother had this, she cannot go with the train, of course. She, she, I was travelling with my father-in-law. And I found the disabled compartment very interesting. I lived in the US for 17 years. And uh, I, what I saw in the US or the West, of course I was not expecting that. But what I was bothered about that the disabled compartment in the train was up very front. Nobody knew whether in the front or in the last track. And there is no, uh, everybody in the general compartment was getting into the disabled compartment. And there are only six, there are only six berths in the disabled compartment. And uh, there, it was the top half and there is no steps to get out. So I had this journey, uh, fortunately I was disabled uh, and uh, I, I, were, I wanted to actually have in, in the long story, just by the long story short, it, it went through the whole time I was in New Delhi from 23rd November to 6th of December. I have gone through the pure hell and I and I was not knowing that just it cannot be reciprocated. Like if you are disabled in the country like US or UK, you just say I am disabled there, this is the letter. No, you need to get a certification from the Indian railways and go to their medical doctors and then you get a certification from the state that you are staying at, then only you will get the certificate. So that is uh, that's my two things, and uh, uh, as I would say that it did cost a lot more to do retrofitting than to include in the previous Pujan thing on the Pujan public uh, policy. That whatever public buildings, hospitals, whatever, to do that in the first place, that is a lot easier and a lot better than if you do retrofitting at the end. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Since all you should have done was tweeted. Suresh Prabhu is always uh, responding instantly <laughs> to all tweets. This was before Suresh Prabhu. So in Tamil Nadu, now they have made a policy that the bogies should be announced before the train comes, half an hour before the train comes, so that the person can move in whichever direction the level uh, friendly uh, bogey is there. So these are some of the small interventions. You know, and that is disclose. That is a disabled person in the family. Okay, so I am using that disabled word. Instead, I should have called the bank now. Yes, yeah, because the Prime Minister has called the Divan with special divine powers. Number one, number two, uh, the barriers which you told. More than physical barriers, the attitudinal or invisible barriers are more for divine persons. So, how to break these barriers? These are the role models who are going to break them. The role of role models is to break these invisible barriers. Okay? Nobody has come out of that problem. I told, if at all I have to get sight, I will get it from him. If at all I am going to lose my sight, it is in his hand only. It is not the doctor who is bad, it is the disease which is bad. There are some incurable diseases which go anywhere in the world. There is no remedy for that. That is what should be. So, I think I am answered many of the, I am uh, answered many of the queries. Uh, I think George had some, yes? Yes. Yes? yes. yes. Okay. No doctor is so cruel that he wants his uh, uh, patient uh, disabled. Okay. No, no, that's not, 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 medical uh, subjects like psychiatry. Then immediate question which I asked him, am I going to be blind? He said, no, you are not going to be blind. Though he may also knew that, I am going to be blind. Even I was knowing that I am going to be blind. It is only the counseling technique which matters most. He told you are not going to be blind. You will be able to live your life with slight vision. I, I knew what is that slight vision. Because I knew I am going to lose vision. It is only the counseling techniques which makes the difference. You are right. You are right in saying so that sometimes you feel your know, doctor is cruel when he says there is no treatment. I think he is doing it out of his ignorance. There is something called tertiary prevention also. After loss of vision, there is something called rehabilitation. I think we have to give more importance to that. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you so much. much for such a
you know, valuable insights. Last question and then we'll close. Yes. Uh, my name is Dr. Prakash Chogli. I'm a U.S. based so uh, yeah, yeah. specialist in the U.S. But uh, coming to, uh, I talked to Dr. Puja earlier. Uh, the the government bashing keeps going on, but we also know they have the resources. Maybe not just rightly handled. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in the process of uh, opening up uh, face tanning cancer centers in the rural area or diagnostic centers. I've talked to a very prominent uh, thought leader who now is a, in the Modi administration. And he said, it depends where you want to do it, about state. Uh, I know you're from Maharashtra, you're probably not more so Maharashtra. I'm from UP, but you're wasting your time. Go to Gujarat, he said. And you know, basically what I'm trying to get at is that there are some governments that are more conducive to uh, helping than others. And I did go to Gujarat, and uh, I had some luck. And then I went to Rajasthan. I was in hometown just three days ago, because I found some non-government good resources. So I think. Government still is, needs to be part of the action. The other question I have is, on a national level, is there a brand name? I have years ago, I spent a lot of opening up a Helen Keller Foundation. Uh, I have no particular reason, but I always had soft for black people. Uh, and I found that in a country with one billion people, there was no Helen Keller Foundation, but Bangladesh had one. So is there like a banner of uh, Helen Keller Foundation that would be instituted, bring all the NGOs and all the government organizations together? Yeah, first, if you are me to answer your question, uh, I do agree that uh, you know, in a, a platform like this, there is always negative about the government. I think uh, I fully agree that who is the government? We are the government. And we should be seeing the ways and means of how to make things work. How do we engage? What do we do? And some of us, at least uh, very closely working for the last three, four, five years, uh, our experience has been not so great, but it's working. And government is the only body which can ensure the most disadvantaged people to get something out of it. So I think I fully agree with you that we have to really see a problem solver and you know, solutions find out. That's one thing. And how it can be done, like you all yourself said, yeah, I'm sure, uh, you know, we need to have a different forms of organizations. There are issues that can be addressed at the local level, there are issues that is better at the state level, there are issues that is better at the national level, because our country is big. So we are making some attempts. For example, we have found recently the Disability NGOs Alliance of Karnataka, where all NGOs of disability has become on a single platform. So that the knowledge sharing, skill sharing, and the best take, taking started happening. And we eventually were looking at to encourage more and more organizations to come to use such platform. So that we will have a different kind of work to be done by different levels of bodies. Because every work cannot be done by everybody. So I fully agree that going forward is that is an answer. And uh, I think we also need to encourage and uh, you know uh, work with to create a different forms of organization which can really find a solution to a larger issue. So which is something I think as a growing uh, sector we have to learn and take it forward. Because this is a very important question. The question was, is there any national body, like say Helen Keller Foundation? We don't have. I think that's the Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just sort of say, that we may not have a single body, but uh, as far as the lines are concerned, uh, a couple of brands are known nationally. One is the National Association for the Blind, which uh, has uh, kind of Branches, which is essentially like uh, somebody says the McDonald's kind of they are franchises in each, every state. Uh, then there is the National Federation of the Blind, and then there is their impact is uh, unfortunately not national. Uh, when it comes to international conferences, uh, these are the people who automatically uh, get uh, uh, they are the kind of constituents of international conferences and so on. So they are the people who represent the country. Uh, People have probably heard the story of uh, the crab philosophy of India. <laughs> you know, so it's very difficult for agencies to come together and work unless there is a common minimum program. And uh, why take Helen Keller or Louis Braille as the name? There are there could be Indian names that uh, could bind people together. <laughs> but uh, there is something called DRG, DRG which is Disability Rights Group. Which is supposed to be a group of uh, NGOs from across India who work together for the rights of people with disability, fighting for the government, advocacy, and so on. But none of this has actually uh, survived the test of time. If 
both are coming to me and you know, they're doing a lot of uh, uh, makeup. So, uh, that's the situation. Uh, with. See, now we understand there's so many organizations, but not an organization which works cohesively to influence a particular point of view or policy or proposed interventions and so on. So, uh, I think uh, we have taken more time than what was allotted to us. I know that 45 minutes is not enough and particularly a topic of this kind. Uh, but I must really thank all the panelists and also uh, all the uh, audience which was listening so attentively and also participating. So just to conclude, uh, you know, if we have to really, because if I go to the different regions and and, and, and meet the political leadership, whether it's in India or Europe or, or US and so on. There is one buzzword. The one word buzzword is inclusive or inclusiveness. Whether it's inclusive government, inclusive economy, and all the inclusive growth, inclusive development, and all kinds of things. So now, everywhere in the world, this word inclusivity is appearing again and again. Of course. There is a big award in, uh, in, a, in a big research grant in Europe which is called Inclusive Innovation and even we have Inclusive Innovation model uh, within India and so on. So what does that inclusivity mean if I have to summarize uh, in just three bullet points. First, to really bring people and include them in the society, those who are excluded, I think the first thing that is required is access, affordable access, access to the education access to the healthcare, infrastructure and so on. The next thing that is extremely important for inclusivity is about long-term investment, sustainable investment. It cannot be that I bring out one particular intervention, I set up a just hospital and forget about it, it doesn't work. It is a long-term sustainable investment that is required. The third and most important for inclusivity is about livelihood. If we cannot provide livelihood to the people, those who were excluded, we, we brought it into the mainstream, they need to be given the livelihood. Then only, I think, we will be successful in creating the inclusive society or, in, or, or taking the nation for an equitable and inclusive growth. So with this word, thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Mahathir, for great work.